Um, okay, so this is a joint work with my student Sao Cheng, who is here, and um, basically I'll just, in the introduction, I'll tell you kind of the whole story, and then you can go to sleep if you don't want to hear the details. Um, okay, so uh, until basically relatively recently, there's been a lot of concentration of work on proximal gradient methods for large-scale optimization for good reasons. They're interesting methods and, you know, a fair amount is known um, by now in terms of convergence rates and the inexact case and so on. I'll give some references later. But uh, it, it has been kind of known for a long time that these methods do tend to be slow to converge and, you know, quite a few problems. So uh, second order methods you know, again, existed for a long time. It would be a natural thing to use, but their use was restricted by the size of the problems and it was not obvious how to do that. Nevertheless, of course, I mean, Ben uh, Recht this morning, if you were here, he very nicely said that I'm ahead of my time doing second order methods and it's not true. And not only it's not true, obviously, lots of people probably in this audience as well, I mean, definitely in this audience as well, have been using second order methods for machine learning. But uh, specifically in the last two, three years, there have been some systematic um, work on these methods. And uh, from the eight papers I reviewed for this year's NIPS, I think four or five were actually on the use of Newton methods. So it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, if it's the next step according to Den, Ben Recht, then one foot is in the air already, let's say. Okay. So, uh, but the difficulty with second order problems is uh, building up, of course, a lot of information from the second order uh, matrix and also solving the subproblems. This is the biggest uh, deal. I mean, this is how do you solve the subproblems? So, to solve them um, for large scale problems, you hope to solve them inexactly. And as a matter of fact, this is generally true for second order uh, methods uh, in that you don't necessarily have to have accurate information. You also don't have to have an accurate step. Any kind of information helps um, in terms of curvature. And it's been known also in optimization for a long time. Uh, so you do want to solve these problems in exactly, but, and there has been some theory uh, basically developed recently, as I said, in the last two, three years, at several papers actually also including at NIPS, um, where under certain assumptions on accuracy on the subproblems, you can show some things about these methods, some convergence, um, maybe even some local convergence rates, although, you know, the results vary. But um, uh, so then you need to basically have sufficient accuracy in your subproblems. And what does this sufficient accuracy mean? Well, depending on your setting, you might have different requirements depending on what you're trying to prove. Requirements are different and the key is to have such requirements that are easy to implement, that are easy to verify, because if you just require the um, subproblems to be solved accurately enough and you can't check it, right, um, then it's, it's not necessarily a very strong um, uh, method. Uh, okay, so, so, so this is basically what we do with this talk. Uh, so first of all, we show global convergence rates for an exact uh, Newton method. Not just Newton method, quasi-Newton method. So we really don't get very great convergence rates. It's a global convergence rates without any assumptions on your second order information. So it's sublinear, just as it would be for proximal gradient method. Um, but nevertheless, there are global convergence rates, which I don't think um, existed before with an exact subproblem uh, optimization. And then um, I will talk about how specifically randomized coordinate descent is an excellent fit for uh, subproblem optimization. And then I'll say a few words how I think the topic of this uh, workshop would actually be a very good um, you know, uh, thing to try next, basically, trying conditional gradient methods. Okay, this is an introductory slide for those who don't know proximal methods. They're, it's basically just a very simple thing. So we, uh, let's say we have a um, convex, so I'm, I'm looking at co composite optimization. So in any case, I have a convex, smooth, nice, whatever, twice differentiable if I need it function here. And I have some kind of a non-smooth uh, nice function here, which is a regularizer. And let's say this is just the L1 norm. And then the typical prox gradient method, the very ba basic vanilla version will approximate this function by its first order approximation plus a prox term. Uh, and then have this thing here and then optimize this function to get the next iterate, right? To optimize this function, you do the uh, shrinkage operator or whatever, proximal um, operator. So this, uh, everybody knows this by now, it's, it's O of N 
effort. It's very simple. It's closed form. So there's no big deal in optimizing this function, right? But this is a first order approximation method because it approximates this function with just first order uh, information. Okay, so in the last uh, few years, and uh, here I list just a few of these um, methods, and you see it starts with roughly 2010. Um, uh, there's been a systematic effort of doing proximal Newton methods. So you can write them down like this. You basically, instead of having the linear approximation, you have a quadratic approximation here, where H is some matrix. It can be the second order matrix, I mean the, the Hessian matrix. It can be some kind of approximation. This is what we do is low rank uh, LBFGS basically matrix, but a little bit, you know, with some augmentation. Or it can be just a diagonal matrix, which is back to proximal gradient. So that would be the same thing. So it's some matrix here. And then again, we have this L1 term. Uh, and then we, the proximal Newton method would go ahead and optimize this function here, uh, obtain the trial point, compute the function, the true function value at the trial point, do some kind of backtracking or uh, line search to make sure that there's sufficient decrease and repeat. Okay, so the same thing as proximal methods except for there's this matrix here, right? Okay, so this is what we're trying to do now. I'm going to just, even though we focus really on L1 in, in our work because, you know, we also need to implement methods and that's where coordinate descent comes in, but um, Generally, the proof of convergence works for any convex um, non-smooth function here that is easy, right? Relatively easy. So I just denoted by P, but what I mean is it can be um, uh, any norm or any um, uh, indicator function. Okay, so, uh, so we have this function here and we need to optimize it, right? So let's look at it just for a minute. If this is L1 term, then we have a Lasso problem, right? A quadratic term here and an L1 with a, um, you know, some uh, weight. So that's a Lasso. If we have something else, then it may be a group Lasso. It may be some other, you know, thing. Okay, we need to optimize this. And as I said, uh, I mean, this is a hard problem in itself, right? So we don't necessarily want to optimize it accurately. So we're saying that we're going to optimize it to this accuracy. So if this was the optimal solution for the subproblem on the kth iteration. So on the kth iteration, quadratic approximation, this is our subproblem. This, if this is the true solution, what we require from the next iterate is basically some kind of accuracy phi k. Now, I don't say anything about phi k at this point, but um, if this is what we have, then the key result, and I'm not gonna give details about this because um, it really doesn't fit that well with the topic and I want to go uh, further than that, uh, but basically um, this is uh, the key result. So we have a sublinear convergence rate. So after k iterations, we're going to have, uh, you know, this basically accuracy for our kth iterate if uh, the square roots of these errors are summable. And the result is actually very similar to, and we indeed follow the proof what was uh, obtained by uh, Schmidt, Leroux and Bach, um, in um, you know the paper in 2011 for the inexact proximal gradient methods, right? So it's a very but there's a lot of tweaks you have to do because you're dealing with matrices now, and these matrices change from one iteration to another. So it's not exactly a straightforward proof, but uh, and we had to change a few things. Uh, but in general, you know, this is general framework. It works. It converges with that rate. Okay. So, and this is what we need, right? So here where we come to, in some sense, the uh, greedy ideas. Okay, so we have a main algorithm. Let me just check my time so that I can. Um, I don't know when I started exactly, but. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is this is the main algorithm. We are um, basically building quadratic approximation, passing it on to a subproblem solver, solve the subproblem and exactly pass back the new iterate and so on. So we continue. And what I'm indicating by these increasing sizes of these gr green rectangles is that we have to put more and more effort as we go along. And the question is how much more effort, right? So we need this uh, to solve problems to a certain accuracy, and this accuracy has to be such that these things are summable. That, that, that's what we want, right? OK, so um, if you look at sparse 
optimization and uh, proximal Newton method, the most successful approaches that we've seen at least use coordinate descent to solve the Lasso sub problem. Somehow coordinate descent is very good at solving things quickly and inexactly. And that's actually for specific reasons because in every method that's been used, they use a specific uh, form of the Hessian or the Hessian approximation to make the coordinate descent more efficient. You can actually use the um, information in the matrix to do these coordinate descent um, operations in a very cheap way, or very cheap way, or somewhat cheap way. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's a good method. However, coordinate descent, as we know, has no convergence rate. So when do we know how to, when to stop? So there's been a heuristic that's been used. Basically, we, it's not exactly what I write here, but it's very similar. So basically, um, if you're on kth iteration, outer iteration, run your coordinate descent for k steps. If you're in k plus first iteration, right, run it for k plus one steps, and so on. So basically, just as you know, iterations grow, just grow, grow the number of steps that you use for coordinate descent, and that was considered to be a um, heuristic. And these basically uh, papers here, for example, use that and say, okay, it's a heuristic. But actually, if you use um, uh, randomized coordinate descent, not coordinate descent, but randomized coordinate descent, it's no longer a heuristic. It's actually a provably good method. And this is, so we're using now results from Rick Tarik and Takacha's paper on randomized coordinate descent. The subproblems that we have are all strictly convex. Now the original function doesn't have to be strictly convex, but the subproblems have to be strictly convex. But there's a prox parameter there, so prox term, so they're strictly convex. So therefore they do converge, uh, so the, the, the uh, randomized coordinate descent con converges linearly. So after k iterations you get basically this much accuracy in expectation. After k plus one iteration, you get this much accuracy in expectation, and so on. So basically, you get this geometric series, and the square root of that, of course, is also geometric series. So with a little bit of effort, you can show that in expectation, this is going to give us basically a method that has convergence, um, uh, you know, overall as we need it for the sub. I mean, for for the overall algorithm. Okay. So basically, we now know uh, what it is that we need from the method. To, and, and it's very easy to implement the stopping criteria. We don't need to check how accurately we solve the problem. We just need to run it for that many iterations and then quit. So um, this is the summary. I don't really need to repeat it. What I want to say here is that how I think it may connect to this workshop specifically, besides you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the, the coordinate descent part itself, is that uh, if we want to extend the method for other norms, and maybe um, not norms, but the indicator functions and more complicated problems, we have to solve a quadratic optimization problem there, basically all the time. And, uh, and so in more complicated cases, using some versions and linearly convergent versions that uh, Simon was talking about and Robert were talking about with linear rates of uh, conditional gradients. So possibly using conditional gradients, we haven't tried it, it just, you know, we may do it after we go home from here or somebody else might do it, but I think it might be a very good fit for inexact subproblem solutions. Um, and uh, you can exploit the, the structure of the Hessian matrices and the special, um, uh, you know, and, and make this uh, iterations of the uh, proximal gradient methods simpler if you use special structures such as low rank or as in some cases it's, you know, uh, the, the, it's a, a chronic product of some matrices or some other things. Okay, that's basically all I have, and thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. So the sublinear rate, um, yeah. how does it compare to the proximal gradient method? It's the same. It's the same. Right, right. But you can't, so Newton method globally, uh, does not converge better than the, the yeah. The, the and also, uh, sort of a follow-up, I guess, have you thought about like accelerated, like second order accelerated kind of thing? Very good question. I mean, didn't think about it deeply. It may be very hard because the matrix, so, so right now we allow the matrix pretty much change on every iteration uh, in a bounded way, but pretty much arbitrarily. So you're allowed to do all kinds of things. For accelerated versions, you may have to restrict it a lot. But it might be possible, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as your iterations go on, your um, proximal problem should be easier to solve. Your iterations would 
Yes, yes. No, not yet. I'm thinking we could probably do that. I don't know yet how. Yes, it's a, exactly a very good point. So it's actually better than what we show. It must be better. But yeah. I would think with a variable metric method that now appear with proximal gradient. S sorry, say it again. Variable metric method. Uh huh. When you put the uh, exa when you apply direct CD on the proximal gradient. Yeah, w w what is the question? How it's related to this thing? Oh, uh, uh, I mean, variable metric method is quasi-Newton method. So, uh, so you can use, yeah, I mean, it's basically pick your favorite method for <laughs> building up um, uh, your Hessian approximation. The only thing is, uh, so, uh, so the only thing is, uh, the sub-problem, as I said, is a hard one. So we, for example, in our implementation, use limited memory VFGS because we want, first of all, convex um, objective. So we want strictly con uh, you know, positive definite matrix. And second, we want something low rank because it makes, so coordinate descent steps for us have um, fixed complexity. It's like O of M where M is the number of uh, columns in your, you know, in, in the rank of your Hessian. So it it's, it's makes it very cheap. Uh, you can use anything if you can if your sub problem is result you know is reasonably easy to solve. Yeah. Yeah. So in some cases, um, choosing second order information allows you to uh, basically bypass the issues of uh, uh, badly conditioned problems. Right. So how would you compare the, uh, this against uh, preconditioning of the first order method? So you precondition the first order method, and then, and then you know it acts as if the second order information. Works. I mean, it's probably, so in some sense, that's what we're doing. We're kind of preconditioning a first order method on every major iteration in a certain way. I mean, there are probably other ways to do it. Yeah, it's, um, again, you know, how to, yeah. It's, it, so, so the thing is, it's, uh, um, the, in, in, in general convex smooth optimization, you use a precondition and then you have some kind of a, um, you know, conjugate gradient to solve the problem. So th there is, with this non-smooth term, basically coordinate descent in a, in a way is a, is a bad surrogate for the conjugate gradient. Uh, there possibly are better ways of doing it. Again, you know, it just seems to work well. We were going after theory explaining why, and then we'll expand it maybe to other things, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Okay. okay.